Okay, yeah, so I'm uh, very happy to be introducing uh, Andre Dehan. Um, so Andre received his uh, this, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, I didn't do it. Um, so uh, Andre received his uh, um, undergrad, master's, and PhD degrees uh, in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in uh, 1990, 93, and 96. Um, and uh, from 1996 to 99, um, Andre co ran the uh, uh, Reconfigurable Architectures and Systems Group at uh, Berkeley. Um, from uh, 1999 to 2006, um, he was an uh, assistant professor of computer science at um, Caltech. Um, and in uh, 2006, he joined the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, um, where he is now a, a full professor. Um, so um, he's broadly interested in how we implement computing from substrates, um, including uh, VLSI um, and uh, everywhere from uh, nanotechnology up through architecture, um, computer-aided design and the programming models. So I'm very happy to welcome him here. So thank you. In the next few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the journey that uh, John and I took trying to understand how to make sense of um, messy nanotechnology. So here we are trying to understand the, uh, nanotechnology as kind of a key vignette in here. I'll talk about the work that we did on decoders uh, and particularly how John taught me how to count um, and building decoders. Uh, if there's time, we'll talk a little bit about some variations and we'll follow up, uh, hopefully end up understanding that counting is a key to understanding how we can count on messy nanotechnology. So kind of early 2000s, uh, the chemists were beginning to demonstrate some, some interesting things. They're starting to see that we could look at ways that we could build uh, wires that were just a few atoms wide from the bottom up. So this is very much a cartoon picture, but it's drawn to scale in the sense that when I show five or six atoms across, that's the scale of wires that they were beginning to talk about. So in particular, uh, we were, uh, ended up working with Charlie Lieber, who's a, a physical chemist at Harvard. Uh, they were starting to show some really interesting things. So he was growing nanotubes and beginning to grow nanowires. Uh, and he was beginning to show that you could put some engineered function into these devices. Uh, and one of the ones that was particularly interesting to me was beginning to show that he could dope these things so you could get semiconducting properties or conducting properties within the wires. Uh, they were also beginning to show that they could assemble the wires together and uh, them and other people were beginning to show that you could put molecular scale switches at the wire cross points, which really started getting us think about switching networks, think about logic, think about memories built out of these devices. So this is all very promising, but there was a challenge to it. As we started looking at it, uh, they could say, well, I can build these wires, but we can't control where they go. Uh, and they would say, well, we could get, uh, you know, we, we as chemists think that yield of 95% is pretty good, which is very different from uh, what I'm used to out of lithography when we're talking about, well, how many nines do I get on the, raw, on the yield of each of my transistors? Uh, the variation was very high for these devices, uh, and things were likely to change and wear out during operation. Uh, so I started thinking about kind of nanoscale technology like snowflakes. Each thing that we're going to build is going to be unique, and it's likely to change throughout its lifetime. Uh, and so that's one, one of our challenges there. So this messy nanoscale technology is the thing we we're looking at. And one thing I realized, perhaps a little later, but it, as part of this journey, is I started realizing that this is going to be true of anything at this scale, including uh, CMOS. And some of my work since then has been taking some of the lessons we had here and putting it back to even using it as in scale CMOS technology. And so essentially the, the idea is that in the past, what we had was we had a large number of atoms below the device level. And since we had a large number of atoms below the device level, we could reasonably ask the uh, technologists, the applied physicists, the device people um, to build reliable devices. So we could count on these devices because of the aggregate effects of a very large numbers of atoms or dopants or bonds. Essentially, we had law of large numbers, good complexity um, combinatorics thing, below the device level that drove really reliable macro scale behaviors in our devices. And so when we had thousands and tens of thousands of dopant atoms, 
things were pretty, uh, pretty consistent. Uh, so here we are trying to think about, uh, look at things at the nanoscale. And the reality here is we'd like to start building things where our devices were kind of comparable to the size of atoms. But if we're trying to build things out of devices that are comparable to the size of atoms, that means we have no more large numbers in terms of comprising the devices, uh, which means that uh, we're going to have to cope with high variation and defects. And so this is one of my uh, graphs that uh, I like to use to illustrate this, where we look as we move down in feature size, we look at, well, how many dopants do I have in there? And then you kind of go back and you realize, well, you know, those dopants are placed there statistically. Uh, and so, in fact, the number of dopants, um, as we get to smaller and smaller uh, that we potentially have in there, we're going to have higher variation in the number of dopants. And that's what's fundamentally causing this higher variation in our device. In this particular case, I happen to show threshold voltage. That's what we often think about uh, when we're thinking about designing transistors. But it's true of many of the effects that are here. Uh, and so our old solutions that we had at the time, people said, well, you know, I kind of know how to handle variation. We'll just margin for it, right? But these old solutions tend to fall down. So margins really don't work anymore at these scales. So here's a, uh, an example. Here's my older technology. And so I scaled my newer technology, and it gets faster, at least if I look at this mean of the distribution. But the variation's larger. And so if I've had to margin so that I'm way out in the tail, well, getting the reliability I'd like, I may actually make things worse out here. So if I accept the old way of doing things, um, I'm going to reduce or eliminate my net benefit um, that, that I would get. So you know, I should be doing this. I'm starting to give it up for, for variation. And maybe it's actually going to get worse as I go to future technology. And if that happens, that's the end of beneficial scaling here. So we, we, we were encouraged to, um, or kind of necessary for us to start thinking about how do we change the rules. So this is the, uh, the kind of question that was at our forefront was, how do we build and operate computing systems with this messy technology? Where assembly is statistical, uh, our, we have high defect rates, we have high variation. One of our detractors says, you're building with irreproducible devices. Um, so OK, let's see if we can do that. Uh, another thing came out there, if you run some of the numbers, it says, oh, you know, I, I'm going to lose a device every 30 milliseconds. So maybe that's an extreme one, but it was an interesting challenge to start thinking about. Um, and they're continually aging, right? And so another way of saying that is how do we cope with kind of a lack of large numbers below the device level? So that's what brought us, you know, that's kind of the context in which we're working. And we started you know, a specific problem that we, we got together on was trying to understand how do we build decoders that would allow us to reach down to the nanoscale. Uh, the, 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 uh, certainly the idea here is we can build these, um, these microscale wires, and they're big. We've got this opportunity from the bottom up to build really small feature sizes. If we could build a decoder that would help us bridge between the, the scales so that we could then uh, reach down electrically to this uh, size, that'd be good as, as far as a bootstrap and get us started. Right? Um, and so we, we know from the things that the uh, chemists were doing that they could code the wires. But as we said, we can't really control which wires go in here. We couldn't go pick a particular one. So our question was, how do we go out and, and give ourselves the ability to reach down to this scale and build a decoder when we couldn't assemble things deterministically? And so we started looking at, and you know, we had some hints. So we started looking at, well, can we build a decoder statistically? Right? Uh, so the thing we're going to see is that we can uh, get a unique set of codes in here, which will be sufficient to allow us to reach down to this level by using statistical assembly or random mixing. Uh, so the, uh, I get, I've got an example I'll kind of work with you a little bit on here. We'll consider we have some large number of codes, at least for the sake of illustration, so like a million codes. So you know, a large number to work with. We'll have a large code space, so a million of each type. So maybe that means we have 10 to the 12, 12 total. So we're not really worrying about um, you know, how it's going to change the population when we sample things. And for the sake of our initial intuition, let's think about a small array. So maybe it's 10 wires, right? And so the question that we want to ask is, OK, if I'm going to select these 10 wires randomly from this group of, ten, of a million codes, what's the likelihood that all 10 are unique? Right? And so that's the kind of question, if you're looking, you know, think about it, that's the kind of question we're getting to do. Um, we wanted to understand this, we wanted to figure out how to generalize this. And so this was a counting problem right, uh, here to try, to try to work out. And so. Uh, so here we can, can kind of work, work through it, right? It's a counting problem. What's the probability that all are unique? Well, 
So for, when we pick the first one, of course, it's going to be unique. There was nothing else for it to conflict with. Right? Uh, when we pick the next one, well, the likelihood of it being the same as the first one is only 1 in 10 to the 6, 1 in a million, right? Because we've only picked one code already, and there's, uh, you know, there's a lot there. So I pick the next one. It's, it's 2 in 10 to the 6. I keep going. And it's uh, you know, 9 and 10 to the 6. OK, so maybe those are not unreasonable numbers. We can generalize a little bit. Here's my C is the total code space, 10 to the 6. Here's my, my numbers down here. N is 10 in this particular case. Uh, and so we can get a, get an, begin to get an equation out of it. That took some help to get, uh, to get me here. But even this started looking pretty, I wanted to generalize it. I wanted to understand something I could work with as an engineer to do design. And so here's where. You know, uh, uh, you know, John got me this far, but here's where really John said, he said well, look, you know, when you analyze these things, um, you know, maybe a, we, we can come up with a bound that's, that's good enough for you. Um, and he observed that, well, you know, all of these things um, are, uh, all of these values are larger than 1 minus n over c, right? So they're kind of the largest uh, number there. Um, and so I can get a bound here, and now we start getting a simple equation that's maybe getting closer to closed form. And so we get a, a solution that, uh, that looks like this. Um, and so from that, we could go through and calculate something. In this case, we could calculate it out. You know, the likelihood that all 10 of these things are completely unique is quite high. It's 99.99%. Right? That starts looking like a number maybe I can engineer with. Right? Uh, so there's the, the calculation here. So that seems, seems good. It looks like this is a plausible thing to do. But of course, uh, you know, we're engineers. So this example was, was picked to kind of build our intuition that this could be done. But as engineers, we want to know, well, how much do we actually have to spend? It actually costs me something to code each of those wires. Uh, that, so I'd like to be able to optimize it and reduce it. But now we have some tools that will allow us to, to uh, analyze and do that. And so we went on. And uh, we might ask the question, well, how large does code space actually need to be? And we observed that um, you know, given n wires addressing, if we had a code space of size 100 n squared, um, then we have a probability over 99% of all the wires being unique. So that's what we wa wanted to, the kind of thing we wanted to do. Um, and this has a nice property in that if we've got a building a logarithmic decoder, so we're s the number of bits we need in there is log of this value. So that's log of 100 n squared. Okay, so that's about 2 log n plus a constant factor. So it's only about twice the size of had we had a deterministic decoder. So that starts looking reasonable, right? We start. We, we, we have to pay something for the fact that it's randomly assembled, but it's only a factor of two. We get this benefit of being able to reach down and build things out of uh, this nanoscale. So that's, uh, so that's really encouraging. That was the uh, source of the first paper that uh, we published together there. Now, once we had that, the, there's a lot of variations. You know, this is kind of a tool that we can start applying to a lot of different problems. I'll get, just highlight one more, and that's the case where you say, well, you know, how many unique wires do we get? So let's say it's OK to overpopulate, but how many unique do we end up in there? So I'll look at the case in which my codes and my wires are the same. I'm going to populate uh, you know, n wires. And I look at, well, how many unique here? Look at the fraction, u over n, do I actually get? And you see this property that as n starts getting large, right? There's, here's my, these are different uh, levels of guarantee. So my distribution is tightening here. And I've got something that's kind of over 50%. Right, over 50, I'm at, at kind of 50 or 60 percent unique wires, uh, so that's starting to look pretty good. Now this problem was particularly interesting to me because we needed to restore our wires, and so I needed to be able to put down, uh, you know, put down some things that are coded in a particular place so I could restore one of those wires. Uh, but I couldn't put it down like this. I had to put it down randomly in the way that we've just seen. And what that result starts showing is, yes, if I do them randomly, I can expect that about 50 or 60 percent of these things will be restored, or if you will, I only have to overpopulate by about a factor of two, uh, and then I can get the, uh, I can end up building a design with the properties I'd like. And so there's a, you know, okay. So the key idea that starts coming out here is that we want to use law of large numbers above the device level, where we now have large numbers of things, like nanowires and gates and memory cells, um, and then we do that, we can start guaranteeing statistically aggregate properties, um, like addressability, yield, and restoration. Um, and that's going to be sufficient to tame this messy nanotechnology. And we see that counting or analysis is really a key to, um, to achieving these designs. Now, just one more thing. I'm glad to see that, uh, that Ben walked back in. 
So one of the other stories of our collaboration is that uh, Ben Goshman uh, was an undergrad with, uh, with John. Uh, and so John did some work with him, and then he sent him off to work with me at Caltech. Um, and we did some more work in this area. Uh, so getting back to that uh, problem that uh, we're building with this high variation technology. And so some people would say, well, this is irreproducible uh, devices. Um, and per here's a graph that perhaps illustrates that they're right. These are irreproducible devices. Here we go. We look at um, when we put these things together, I have two curves here. One is how long the val before the value leaks away. And the other one, which is how long does it take to switch? And well, one of them is multiplied by 100, but you get the um, idea. You'd really like these two things to be separate. So we have some devices that can't hold on to their values while the others are taking their time computing. Right. Uh, and if that's, that's going to be a problem, because we need some of these, we need these things, everybody to hold on to their values while people finish computing. So this is sort of the source of the problem. Now, the observation that we started making here is that designs actually have different needs. They don't have a homogeneous need for our speed of things. And in fact, uh, some of them need to fan out a lot more than others. So when things fan out, uh, they're gonna, that's going to slow them down naturally. Right? And so if we can use these sort of devices that are racing ahead, that they're fast, we can pair them with the things that slow them down a little bit and let the ones that are slower, give them an easier job, let them uh, drive less fan out, we can perhaps compensate these two things. And so we have this opportunity to match the needs of our computation with the supply of our transistors. And when we do that, um, we actually can begin to achieve separation. So this is the sort of thing you'd actually like to see where all of the um, the things run faster than anybody leaks. And that's why I, I wrote multiply this by 100x. If these two things uh, just touch, that means there's a two order magnitude separation between them. And we get a good, um, we have a, a well defined clock rate at which we can run, and these things will actually work. So putting that together, right, we can easily see that, we've, uh, uh, that it's sufficient here, really, to statistically yield the nanowires. It's going to be sufficient for us to use the good ones and avoid the bad ones. Statistical addressing and restoration are sufficient to allow us to address down at that scale and uh, perform uh, restoration in there. It's sufficient to have diodes as the only programmable element now that we have a way of restoring it. And it's sufficient to have statistical yield of programmable cross points and these thresholds if that's something we can exploit in the mapping. So what we see is that we can begin to count on, we can begin to rely on this messy statistical nanotechnology by exploiting law of large numbers above the device level, right? So we replace the law of large numbers that we no longer have below the device level with it above, and that demands some significant counting or analysis um, at the system level in order to do that, and that means that computer engineers like myself need to learn how to count, and in that sense, I'm very happy to have had John as a tutor and guide uh, through this process. <laughs>